still like gays and lesbians so much. Would Christ? Would Christ? No. Um, you know, why do so many Christians? I don't want to be judging people that have, have difficulties. I want to suggest that as a church, the Episcopal Church, and particularly St. Paul in the desert, wants to be a place that's welcome to folks who are heterosexual or homosexual. And the issue is that we have each been raised with a particular way of seeing things. And it is often difficult for us when those traditional ways are challenged. And the challenge for me is, how do we become enough of a fellowship that we can bridge the gap between change and what God's truth is? Would Jesus be looking down on gays and lesbians? No. Uh, if you look at Jesus, he's embracing those that the rest of society would look down on. The difficulty for us is, how does that work when the gay and lesbian community has become even a majority in our congregation, and it is no longer a minority on the edges, my question is, is, is there room for other people in this church? <laughs> I want to make sure that people who see things from a traditional perspective know that they as persons are valued, even if we can't necessarily agree with them on their interpretation. Why don't the priests kneel for the confession? Um, besides aging, <laughs> kneeling is something that is a uh, personal devotion that has become traditional in the last, let's say, 150 years, but was not necessarily universal in the church. And I think that uh, you will see us kneeling during Lent. Occasionally we kneel a lot during Advent, but we did this last year. But during Lent, you'll get your fill of us kneeling. <laughs> Does the Archbishop of Canterbury have any significance for the Episcopal Church in California? Well, we had lunch together approximately 25 years ago when he was dean of Clare College, Cambridge, so he will always have a place in my heart. Uh, but he does have significance. He's the titular head of the Anglican community. He is an incredibly bright and gifted speaker and thinker, and he is stuck in an almost impossible job. And the choices that he's made, in my opinion, have helped make it even more impossible and made it very difficult sometimes for people in the Episcopal Church to feel like we have a place in the Anglican community. How do you like the book, The Secret Message of Jesus, and how will the whole diocese be able to discuss this? Uh, I like the first five, six chapters that I've read. I think it is not what I call the deepest of all books that I've read, but it is an interesting path of an individual reflecting on how um, they try to sort out what's really most important about Jesus' message. And I think that just getting together and talking about it and knowing that across the diocese we're having a common conversation will be beneficial to us as a diocese. Is Jesus the one true God? If not, why believe in him? I believe Jesus is the only Son of God. I believe Jesus is the Son as in the Trinity formulation, is the one true God. I believe God is the only God. And Jesus is a part of that. What usually this comes up with is with the passage in uh, John, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, I am very comfortable with that belief. And, and I think that it is fantastic. It does not require that we make everybody else believe the same thing we do or we will dismiss, um, hate, or try to destroy them. People do not believe need to believe that Jesus is God or the only Son of God for us to get along and to work together. And it does not affect my beliefs if somebody else does not believe exactly the same as I do. Do I have to become an Episcopal to be a member of St. Paul's? Technically, no. We have lots of people who are members of our church, but not necessarily Episcopalians. To be a member, write this down. <laughs> you either need to be baptized here, or your baptism needs to be recorded here. You need to 
um, work, pray, and give for the spread of God's kingdom. Here, did you get that? Give. <laughs> In the old days, we used to say you had to be a giver of record for the previous 60 days. That means you have to write a check or you have to tell somebody, here's my gift. But we don't really get that picking these days. We just want you to not forget. <clears throat> How do I know if I'm a good person? Beats me. <laughs> During Lent, why does the Church of St. Paul's not cover the crosses in the church? I would ask, why would we cover the crosses? I mean, here's the thing. Many churches have developed traditions and customs, and some of those customs have become so widespread as to um, become something like a theology or a doctrine. But in general, the idea was during Lent, you tone things down. So you put gaudy purple coverings over everything you want to tone down. It doesn't work for me. Um, I think if you don't want them there, take them down. And, and then, then there's the, once the altar guild got in mind that this color scheme, that you change the colors during the weeks of Lent, you went from purple to red to black to white, they were, it was on. It was on. We could cover everything. I think that if the issue is to simplify, then we ought to use even colors and textures and other things that remind us of simplicity, not necessarily of putting out extra doodads. Or cover. Why can't we be more environmentally friendly in our practices? We as a church or as individuals? Habit. We have habits. You know, I mean, I'm thinking that I want to be very green, but my daughter lives in Yucca Valley. So if I see my daughter or she sees me, we have to go back and forth. Um, I'm actually doing something kind of green. We're trying to develop video conferencing in the diocese. Um, three minutes, two minute warning. Um, I, we're trying to develop video conferencing in the diocese so I don't have to drive five hours for a 30 minute meeting in San Diego. And um, so we're working on being more environmentally friendly. We have real cups for coffee, not styrofoam. But you know what? That's a long way. That's a long way off. We need to do more with less. We need to get used to less and think of less. We need to think of less a lot more. Then we'll all become more environmentally friendly. We have one more, one more shot. Okay. Let's see. Make it good. It asks a question about why we ignore serious questions in the church. I think it's much more convenient to ignore serious questions than to deal with them head on. Um, and the church is very good about that. But in reality, we deal with serious questions all the time. But in the Episcopal Church, do you know how we deal with our most serious questions? Our most serious issues? We pray. We pray about it. It's what we do in our liturgies. Um, we pray and we bless absolutely everybody in this church. And I have not found a topic that I would not in all sincerity lift up before God that God might guide us. And does that mean answers will be easy? No. Does it mean we'll all agree? No. But questions will be taken seriously. It doesn't mean that I will get my 15 minutes of fame on every issue that I have an opinion about. And I think that's going to be it. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Amen.